I wanted to thank you all for coming this morning. Um, this is our first Humanizing Data Symposium, maybe the first of many, who knows? Um, and I'm really excited to um, have this first panel here. Um, many of these uh, participants are, two of the participants, one of the participants is a student, um, two are faculty members here, and one is an activist outside of the university. So it's kind of a perfect mix of um, the kinds of stakeholders that I wanted to have as part of this symposium. So I'm Becky Amato. I'm the Associate Director of the Urban Democracy Lab here at NYU. Um, and this symposium is sort of the beginning of an initiative that we're starting at the lab called Urban Humanities and Their Publics, which is really focused on um, talking about shared authority and the um, movement of knowledge outside of the academy and the movement of knowledge from outside the academy into the academy. Um, so evening up that exchange. Um, so I'm gonna actually just hand it over to our great panel and have them introduce themselves and begin the presentation. Uh, why don't we just introduce ourselves and yes. then I can start. So uh, my name is Kiwan Karamidis and I'm an associate director and clinical assistant professor in the Draper Interdisciplinary Master's Program in Humanities and Social Thought. Um, uh, my name is Elizabeth Hurd. Um, I'm a professor in media studies, and I teach also at Draper. Hi, I'm Cindy Lee. I'm a student, a graduate student at the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis. I am Jonathan Ned Katz, um, independent scholar and historian and uh, visual artist. So uh, Becky and I were talking a couple months ago about this symposium, and it seemed to match up with a confluence of events that happened, happened to me and to Jonathan, and that led to a class that we decided to do at Draper. Uh, I had been in this room actually talking about another course I had taught online uh, using some tools, and, and Jonathan happened to be in the room, and he raised his hand after my presentation, and it was kind of like, how can you use that platform, Omeka? It's become kind of a miserable nuisance in my project. Uh, I found that intriguing, so we decided to have a meetup and talk about his use of the tools, something that I'm familiar with. And in the kind of, that became a genesis conversation for a lot of interesting things that we found um, we wanted to talk about. And, and so from my perspective, I teach digital humanities and a, a range of uh, media interested questions in my different types of courses. And I'm particularly curious about how people use different platforms and how they knowingly or unknowingly are, are embedding a certain epistemology in the, their use of their work in that platform. Um, and the, the tool in question here was a tool called Omeka, uh, which is a online collections management s software created by the Center for History New Media, which is a very well-known uh, digital humanities center at George Mason University. And it's particularly well-known for its ability to allow public history projects to put themselves forward. Um, it's a web publishing platform as well as collections management. So I've used it in material culture projects and uh, different instances to do web presentations and teaching. And I then understood why someone had suggested it to Jonathan. Jonathan's project is public history. Um, it reaches out, it's telling these amazing stories about the LGBTQ community. But it wasn't a, a public history project that had to do with objects. And Omeka was about using objects. And so there was this dissonance between what Omeka had been designed for and what Jonathan wanted to do. Um, and that was why he was having kind of functional technical problems. But it actually also was causing problematic institutional problems for what he wanted to do. Because it, he was trying to set up a type of story and, and a type of uh, framework, and the tool was pushing against that and was limiting his ability to be expressive and to tell the stories of these individuals. And so that single kind of fundamentally functional qu problem, where like he had to do objects to write essays when all he wanted to do was essays, got us to thinking about, you know, what does it mean to use the web to tell different stories, particularly um, stories of people who haven't been involved in the creation of the web as a platform in a digital media. So we were talking back and forth, and I, I, was, like, I was like, you know, Jonathan, does this platform completely show how the web is even overwhelming the ability to represent queer history? You know, is there a certain kind of whiteness and heteronormativeness to the web, to computer science, that is problematic? Um, and and we start getting a deep philosophical uh, conversation about that, and um, and and so I'm fortunate enough that I get to create really interesting classes at the Draper program, and I saw this as a unique opportunity to meld together LGBTQ history, 
with uh, web design practice uh, instruction and actually kind of a historical theoretical approach to the whole notion of putting information in the internet age online. Uh, and so John and I decided to do a class together and that's kind of expanded. Um, uh, we felt it was important to bring Liz in because she's so highly qualified in these questions of uh, queer studies from her PhD work and her, uh, her work as a professor. And now we have a great cohort of students and Cindy's going to um, represent that for us. So that's kind of how I got involved in the project and Jonathan and I have now been working, I think it was almost a year ago today that we were in, in this, this room. In this it, was, room. Uh, it was kind of funny, I was thinking about that this morning. Um, and so we'd just like to tell you like our story beyond that, how this has all kind of moved forward. And Jonathan's going to give some background about outhistory.org, which is an amazing site, um, uh, which, you know, it has interface problems. And as we dig through the interface problems, we find out how, how much amazing, rich scholarship um, and material is in there. Uh, and, and then, you know, this is going to like kind of help frame the term queering the web, which is the name of the, the course. Um, and hopefully Cindy will share how great we all are as professors. <laughs> uh, um, uh, and, and we and also have, uh, Katie is, I think, you know, we, we invited all the students to come, but it's pretty early on a Saturday morning, so I'm not surprised the percentage of show people here. Um, but Katie is also here in, um, in the audience, and um, Katie is one of uh, Draper's BA, MA undergrad um, students, and so she's, she went full bore into a really high-level challenging class, and so it's been great to have her. So, Jonathan, why don't you kind of give us a, a little background, and I, I can open up about history and chess stuff if you want me to. Yeah, well, the subject about history is LGBTQ uh, history, uh, but it's also about heterosexual history. So um, I think that's an important part uh, of it, to, to think that there is such a thing as heterosexual history. It, it's still like I wrote a book about it. There's um, a, a group of people who are trying to put together a critical heterosexuals, he, heterosexual studies um, uh, book of essays, but not much progress has been made on that. I think um, it's, it says something about the, my desire in founding this website that um, it should really take on critical questions like heterosexual history as well as the other. Uh, as well as LGBTQ. Um, so, um, so maybe it's sort of expanding into uh, gender and sexual history in general. I, that's a way to, another way to put it. Um, a lot of uh, how I think about uh, history has to do with, with the fact that I'm an independent scholar, which has meant that since uh, the early 70s, I've had to scrounge to get into the best uh, data uh, sources to this, uh, to the NYU library, for instance. It was really, I've always felt like a thief in the night uh, walking through the aisles of the uh, important collection at NYU. It was near my house. It was the easiest one to get to. And the, what happened in the early 70s was that uh, because I was an independent scholar, uh, it was like the sort of gay underground librarian network <laughs> got me, uh, you know, uh, a, a card that got me into the library. And that was really, really crucial. And today, you know, there's the issue of uh, access of, of people to um, databases. For instance, uh, uh, newspaper, which, newspaper databases, which are pretty much private. Uh, pro they've been developed by private companies, so you only get uh, access by paying for access to newspapers.com or one of the others, and they've all collected different ones. It's really, it's uh, anarchy of capitalism. Um, so um, it's really a problem for scholars uh, who are outside of academia to get access in, into the most up-to-date and crucial, crucial, those newspapers are amazing sources of, uh, you know, especially in terms of uh, restoring the history of people who haven't had a history for a long time. So, um, so I'm interested in um, actually, his, I would call it history for the people. 
Um, I'm from the 60s, so we, t we talked about things like that then. Um, public history, it's a form of public history to do history on the web. And I'm very in, uh, concerned to always have citations and, so, and, and cite the sources of uh, the evidence of, 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 of fact claims. That seems very, very important today when there's so much uh, rumor uh, floating around the internet, uh, so many uh, claims by politicians that have no basis in fact, at all, in evidence at all. Um, it seems especially important to try to also uh, not only present the data to the public uh, freely, without cost, but to also raise questions about how you think about evidence, how a critical attitude towards uh, the evidence that, that is the basis for various uh, truth claims. So, um, um, so, so uh, my, my position about all of this also comes out from the fact that I'm um, a democratic socialist which is part of why I want, you know, free data for the people. Um, and that's a big part of my thinking and, and uh, a big part of how uh, I'm also interested in theory. I've studied Marx's historical theory uh, deeply in the past. And so I'm not only concerned with the recovery of evidence, but I'm also concerned with the frameworks that we use for understanding the evidence and evaluating the evidence. Um, I have uh, been, I think of the recovery of LGBTQ history and heterosexual history as, um, as a form of activism, actually, I really a form of activism. My work in, in LGBT history started um, in, uh, for a documentary play that was put on by the Gay Activist Alliance in 1972, and that got quite a bit of publicity because the director was, was a, actually a professional um, publicity agent, so he knew how to get the New York Times uh, to do a story on our play. And that led to me doing uh, the first book of documents called Gay American History, which was a book of different kinds of documents that show there was plenty of evidence for, uh, we called it gay history then, gay and lesbian history in those days. Um, so, um, um, I think, I mean, I, when I think about the history as activism, I, I, it always comes to mind first that the, the mass media images of LGBT few people have been so banal, so superficial, so one-dimensional. I think of one reason that what history is activism because it restores people to a complexity which we haven't had access to. I'm really interested in, in that. It, it gives us uh, an alternative to those banal uh, images of all those suicides of the, the gay person in the, in the different movies and things, and plays, uh, and novels uh, from the old days. <laughs> um, so I think knowing a sense of history uh, is important for make, making us, giving us more a sense of complexity, basically, about ourselves. Um, there's also many uh, ways, direct ways, that history has had um, a direct political influence. The, the historian's brief in the uh, 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 Oberfell and Hodges in the marriage decision, the Supreme Court's marriage decision played a big role. The historian's brief in uh, Lawrence v. Texas that did away with sodomy laws, the, the historian's brief was really important in that case. Um, in Military Policy, a book by Alan Barabay on gays in World War II was really important in helping people see that in the historical perspective, the, the issue of gays in the military. So there's many, I could cite many examples of how 
uh, history has played a really activist role in, in the liberation struggle of lesbians and gay men and bisexuals and queers and heterosexuals. Um, so, um, out history does have some wonderful content. I think that it's not always clear to people because we don't know how to present, tell people how on the site. It's not adequately presented in terms of all the, the great discoveries that are original material that's available no other place. Uh, for instance, uh, Alan Barabay's talk, uh, No Red Baiting, this is, he was uh, studying a union that was a ship stewards union in the 1930s and 40s, and their motto was, in the 30s, was no red baiting, that's no, you know, an, no anti-communist baiting, no race baiting, because they were a mixed group racially, and no queen baiting was the third one. <laughs> I just, it's amazing to me that this, I mean, it's an amazing thing to recover that history. Uh, out history uh, has uh, republished uh, Alan, Alan Bernstein's 150-page um, um, defense of homosexuality that he wrote in 1940 when he was in the U.S. Army and got him thrown out of the Army. Um, it's, and we found out all about his amazing life. And, um, there's, let's see, there's material about Edna Thomas, uh, who was an, a black uh, African-American actress uh, and, uh, and who was written up in uh, uh, some early sexological studies where, you, where we've done, people have done work to figure out who are these anonymous or people, they weren't anonymous but they had different names of course in the sexological studies. Um, there's a story about Esther Eng a, uh, an Asian American uh, filmmaker and a restaurateur who I actually met as a kid in, when she was running a, a restaurant in Chinatown. There's a, there's a biography of her. Um, there's just amazing, uh, there's oh, uh, stuff about James Baldwin and his FBI file we, on which uh, J. Edgar Hoover wrote, isn't Baldwin that well-known pervert? He actually wrote that on the, you know, in his handwriting, and we reproduced that. I, oh, there's a whole thing about the history of um, the rumors about J. Edgar Hoover, which I found fast, I find fascinating. The rumors that he was queer in some way. Um, a lot of those rumors are homophobic, um, and they go way back to when he took over the FBI. And then the FBI's. Um, a spy on homosexuals uh, is uh, documented too. There's a whole huge timeline on of this, uh, with citations to the evidence on out history. So those are just a few of the marvelous original uh, pieces of research. It's full of that, and uh, you wouldn't know that from just looking at the innocently looking at out history. Um, so. Um, so just a qu to quickly go over how hi out history developed, um, it started out um, with media wiki software, which is the same software that uh, Wikipedia was using. And at the time in the, uh, the early 200s, the, the uh, 200s, 2000s, uh, I mean. <laughs> very <laughs> not, old website. Not too old, I don't know. <laughs> I'm pretty old. But, um, uh, uh, Wikipedia was having this great success with people were volunteering to put information on and even though there was all the criticism of uh, so lousy sources and, and there still is, um, still it was a, an amazing creation that was free. It's a wonderful source as a beginning source to go to for research, um, I think. Um, so I thought, well, if, even if we got just a little bit of that interest in the, from the public in creating a gay history, LGBT history website, we'd be really successful. So we used the same uh, media wiki. You can show the actual, can you do that? Get yeah, to the yeah, original like source. The, the original uh, out history is uh, still online. It's not publicly online. It's um, um, this. Uh, That's it, right? 
Uh, yeah, that's the original one. So you can still search it, but you need me to tell you, uh, give you the link to it, because it's not, it doesn't get, it's not on Google. It doesn't, it's not public that way. Um, so what happened, so it actually didn't work. The, the idea of, uh, of getting the public to actually create most of the content on the site as they do with um, Wikipedia it didn't work for a history site. And I think, I think it's because people understand what it means to put content on an encyclopedia, but they get nervous or they don't think they know how to write a entry on a history site. I think that's the reason. Um, there were a few exceptions in which uh, some men, uh, uh, I, I wrote about um, um, John William Sterling and the man he slept with and um, lived with for 40 years and he, you know, you've heard of Sterling Library at, at uh, Yale. Well, he and Sterling, everything at Yale, there's like about five or six buildings named after him because he gave so much money to Yale. He's one of the major early donors at Yale and it turned out that he lived with this guy and there's very interesting information about him. And uh, some guys uh, on some other website heard about this and got together and actually transcribed his, they did a huge amount of research on the, this, this couple uh, um, uh, Sterling and his friend, and so that was one. There are a few examples where people, the public, did create amazing content, but basically it didn't work in general. I created it, or I got other people to create the content on our history. Um, so I was busy. What happened next was that I was busy um, uh, writing um, a a theoretical essay. And uh, at that time, uh, a dear friend, John D'Amelio, uh, took over as a co-director of Out History, and he was at the University of Chicago. And um, he uh, oversaw the redesign of Out History um, with Omeka software, which was developed out of a history department. But I would say, I, I mean, I. I think that it's never received a careful criticism. I don't think, for instance, there, in, in uh, MediaWiki software, the original software, it took about seven steps to create, con uh, put the content on out history. With the Omeka software, it takes about 75 steps. So it got hugely more complicated. That's actually the major thing that, that I, I feel sort of locked out of my own baby, my own website baby, um, by the amount of work, unnecessary work that it takes to create content on the site now. Um, knowing that, I mean, I think that a lot of people who um, support Omega do not on a regular basis, try to put lots of content, and we, you can argue, we can argue about this, um, m uh, don't put content on, on a regular, lots of content on, on a regular basis. That's, uh, I, I mean, w we can talk about this. <laughs> um, we have a difference of opinion here, so that'll be very creative. Um, uh, so, um, I actually do feel shut out of the site now because it's so hard to create content. I mean, I, I can follow the steps, but do I want to bother, you know? So it's, so, so um, it, it, I think the site got worse rather than better in the time, and, and this dear friend was o overseeing this happen, but he just went along with a, what a designer said. And it sounded like the right software, the Omeka, because it was developed by history. Uh, uh, department, but anyway, so um, so I'm now desperate to get out history redesigned, and um, that's how I ended up speaking with Kimon, and um, and um, and I, 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 it's really interesting to have this class. Consider all the aspects 
of what it means to redesign a site. What, what, what is the nature of a history site? I think it's a, a web history site is something new in the world. It's not, it's sort of like a museum. It's sort of like an archive. It's sort of like a newspaper. But it's, it's different from all of those things. You can, you can revise you know, immediately when something, if you make a mistake, you, and you can say that and, and change the text. So it's different from a book publication. Um, so figuring out the best way to present the actions of people together over time is a problem that's a very interesting creative problem. And I have prepared a vision statement, a long vision statement that's very um, ambitious and, and sort of grandiose about what I would like it to do. I would like it, it out history to present like, um, what do we know? Well, it should present everything that we now know about LGBTQ US history as a focus. I think it needs to have a focus. Otherwise, it gets too sort of watered down. And um, anyway, that, I, that focus helps it be uh, specific. Um, so, um, so I started talking to Kimon about uh, uh, Omega software, and it led to us doing this wonderful class, and which has been so interesting and valuable. And so I think we, you can, that leads into maybe you talking. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I was gonna, I was gonna run through the structure of the class because it, it's a good frame for explaining how we decided to approach things. Um, I mean, I guess to like to kind of riff. Jonathan and I had this conversation, and we had this the same conversation that we're having right now, like in our heads, even I can tell. Um, and uh, and uh, and it's the great. It's like we keep on coming back to it because it's like our, our pivot point. You know, like well, how do we how do we think of the question this way? And then we turn again on, and it's the same thing over and over again. Like, what does it mean to create a website? What does it mean mean to create a history website? Uh, and and I don't think there's a history website platform either. The thing is that there are many history. There are many histories and there are many approaches to histories. And so to, to, you know, to talk about where this um, tool on Mecca came from again, the Center for History and New Media, you can tell in the DNA of the tool and you can tell from the DNA of the people that it was, it started, at the, they thought of kind of the ontological units, you know, that, and the epistemology of the tool as, well, you're going to build an archive or collection of historical artifacts and objects. That is going to be your starting point. And then any work you do from there will use that collection as the basis. Um, and then you'll build out, right? And so there's literally an exhibit builder, which is a way to kind of tell these stories, which is um, what's happening on uh, outhistory.org. Um, and then you can add uh, other different features of mapping tool called Neatline. But you can't get away from the fact that at, the, at its core, Omeka wants objects. And then there, all the other tools are built based on those objects. So the reason that it's hard for Jonathan to create an essay in Omeka, where it was easier in MetaWiki, is rather than just dropping a, a chunk of text in, what you have to do in Omeka to create an essay is you have to choose your text, and then you have to choose chunks of text, and then you have to pick the object, which is an image, which you've now put it in. And, and all of that stuff actually has nothing to do with what Jonathan wants to do with history.org because the, the objects are not fundamentally important as artifacts. They're just ways to get pictures in. Uh, because there's no core, there's no core set of archived objects in outhistory.org. It's more of a collection of essays, right? That's like, well, that's slight distortion, I would say, because I, as I continue to do LGBT history over the years. Certainly, I was very text heavy at the beginning, but as I've gone along, and I think all of us now realize more how important all kinds of visual materials are. Right. So I would say they're really a basic part okay, but of so, the site. So I totally agree with that, but what I'm saying is not, is not that. It, Yes, the site is fundamentally based on the images, right, and that and the, the the visual materials. But it's not based on the idea of an object with a set of metadata that is a building block, right? And and that 
So that is both a fundamental kind of concept of the approach to history, you know, like what you're prioritizing, but it also ultimately becomes a computer si science building block structure that then gets in your way when you're trying to code and lay out the structure. And this is what I, we started realizing, and I started seeing, because I've been fortunate enough to understand all these platforms, and I, I, we already talked, ab we had talked about why MediaWiki made sense, too, because there was this idea of uh, MediaWiki allows for a, a conversation backend, which was another part of this uh, initial phase, and, and you can do that with Omega but it's a little wonky because once again it just wants to talk about the objects and people talking about the objects. Can you, can you um, just clarify what you, what you mean by object? In this uh, literally an object, a physical mm -hmm. artifact mm -hmm. because the way Omeka is built is to create a digital representation of a physical artifact that lives somewhere. So it's uh, like we're a museum with it, objects. It's, it's, a, it's a riff on a collections management system with a web publishing front end rather yeah. than like WordPress which is a text based system which wants to deal with blocks of text first. Um, and so that's, so when I'm, it's like what I say when I mean object, it's literally like a thing that mm -hmm. like then has, and actually the representation in Omeka is a series of metadata. Even the files aren't actually the thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can, that gets a little messy when you start talking about media objects. Um, but even the Center for History and New Media, the, their choice of metadata st structure in the back end is Dublin Core, which is a, a single flat hierarchical um, metadata structure, which is designed to talk about two-dimensional paper physical artifacts. Um, it's really bad for visual culture, and, and I've worked in other realms where we don't like the core of Omeka for that reason too, because its epistemology is of archival research, not a visual material culture study. So these these building blocks are very important for when you choose a platform, and, and what we've discussed is that Omeka was not the best path for out of history to go on, and what has been happening for the last few years is kind of a retrofit and hacking of the structure. Um, and then you start, you're grinding against gears that make your work harder and discourage you from even putting stuff up. You've never actually said that to, to me in the last oh. year, but that's really depressing, yeah. <laughs> you know? Because yeah. um, like, like, there's not a lot of people who are as, there, I don't think there's anyone as eager as you to get this stuff out there. And if, you're, if your will is squashed, where are we to go? Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and so that's why it felt really important to me. And then I started, it, for me, it, as kind of a media theorist and as someone who studies the digital humanities from a, a very critical perspective, I was like, well, what is like the really deep underlying uh, structure of that? Like, and, and is there even something about the web that's, that's heteronormative? You know, because like, if we have these things between Omeka, MediaWiki, and what Jonathan wants that aren't working, well, how was computer science developed and who were the invested uh, individuals? You know, computer science on like a lot of the sciences is almost completely human structured, right? Like biology is the analysis of like the naturally generated world, chemistry and physics. You're studying stuff that is pre-human, but computer science is all, is all structure and all um, armature that has human hands all over it. So, so then we start getting to the Marcus, Marxist perspective that I have too, it's like who's been invested in that? Um, what time period was its like most powerful generative? And then were people of alternative identities, race, and uh, consideration part of that process? And on top of that, even beyond the computer science, is the, the dominant web aesthetics of design. Uh, so most web design is really hearkening some kind of modern uh, 19, like, early 20th century design aesthetic, right? Like you see Mondrian and there's the grid as a, as a kind of organizing structure. Um, and I've seen that working with designers is something I'm trying to push against as I work on different kind of alternative projects. I'm doing a hardcore punk class in the fall which is asking different questions about this. Um, and so we had this conversation about, well, is computer science heteronormative? And then I was like, well, if you think of when the modern art movement came, it was in a lot of it in Central and Western Europe in a time period where it wasn't particularly easy to be an out gay person, right? So, so how does even the cultural signification of being out of the closet or, or, or straight affect the design norms of the time? And how does that, the repercussions of that long term over the way web design and its notion of universality, which is kind of impossible, but something that gets put into design a lot. Well, how can we just problematize all that? And, and I, I, w I was also talking to Jonathan, we didn't want to say like, it's bad, it's heteronormative, but we at least wanted to ask the question in an active way, rather than kind of allowing those inevitabilities to wash over the process. So it, it was about thinking about the fundamentals of design structure and design aesthetics, and how th there's this now questioning of the role of uh, minorities, uh, minority groups in having in that conversation, and this like if it's a story, if the whole history is about LGBTQ people, but it's within a structure that is in some ways suppressing that story, then how can we work around that or work counter to it? Or maybe it's just not a big deal, and I'm overreacting, but at least we could have that conversation. Um, so you can see the syllabus here, how we structured the class. 
um, and the way we kind of decided to put the students through the paces of approaching this material. So let me turn this a little. Um, so we started here with, you know, we really wanted to like, uh, the challenge of doing like really deeply integrated interdisciplinary work is how do you get some sense of survey for the students? Because in order to do a proper look at L um, uh, GBTQ stuff, you would not want more than three weeks, <laughs> right? Um, go ahead. I don't think anybody could read that. There's electric light, sunlight hitting the screen. We need oh. to turn off the, um, oh. Yeah. Close the doors in the back at least, see if that helps, or oh. turn off the light in the or Maybe that Does that help? help? Does that help? You want to make the font larger to the stick I don't know. Yeah, just a little. Is that better? Okay, yeah, I can scroll. Well, Thank you. It, Does that work better? I Thank you. Thank you. There we go. Um, so we started off the class with a, a combination of questions about um, a, a combination kind of a brief history of LGBTQ, which is like, how do you do that in two weeks? But we, we kind of try to ignore the pedagogical problem of that for at least this class. Uh, um, it was like, go, just go read all about history.org if you want to catch up. Um, and then also to tie in this idea of the social construction of time and history. We, we wanted to talk about how time and the, the presentation of materials um, should be something that you're in control of and to acknowledge the, that the stories of humanity are put together and they're constructed and that we want to unpack them, at least be able to unpack them so that we can reconstruct them in our own sensibility. So that was kind of the first three weeks of approaching the notion of doing history and kind of a deep primer into the um, outhistory.org project and Jonathan's um, per perspective and desires for the project. And from there we moved into uh, three more weeks and one was to kind of start thinking about history design and interaction in the digital media to give the students an understanding of what are some of the, the f uh, technological back ends, the media approaches that, that are the, the driving force behind the way that the the web medium allows us to do work, the way it restrains the kinds of things we do work, and kind of the structures that are inherent to that process, and how they were developed historically. Um, and the, then we started breaking down into like, well, what are the, some of the more theoretical, deeper ways we can pull uh, this aside? So we have this a queer sort of experience performance across the interface week, which is, I love having lots of like wordy, fun uh, titles for my weeks. Um, and that was to start thinking also, uh, one thing that Liz and I both have is, uh, Liz got her PhD here at Performance Studies, and then I've taken a, a lot of Performance Studies. My PhD is actually in theater. Um, and we wanted to start talking about queerness as a, a performative structure and also thinking about the way we use technology as a performative experience and how our interaction with the physical computer um, is part of this social construction of history and part of the social construction of identity. And to provide a digital framework for a lot of the um, post-structuralist critical queer theory that is out there. And then we moved on to these questions about is web design heteronormative? And that included both conversations about online identity, um, the way the grid is kind of a dominant structure in modern aesthetics and for the web, and critiques of that in art history, um, and also how we can hack that. What does it mean to do queer hacking of um, these dominant structures? Uh, and now we're kind of, in, now this is the phase we're in uh, right now, and Cindy can share some of her experiences when we start um, talking about this. But we, we did one last step where um, one tool that uh, Jonathan has also been using in outhistory.org is a tool called Timeline.js. It's a very easy to use timeline building tool that essentially uses a Google spreadsheet. You just drop all your um, date and title information and some links to images and voila, a timeline gets made. Um, so that's wonderful, but also ridiculously problematic, right? Because you're completely yielding all of your aesthetic and organizational control to kind of an algorithmic uh, layout script. Uh, so. As we were talking about the social construction of time, I was like, well, why don't we also talk about the digital construction of the vision of time? And so the students went through and they made their timeline GS JSs and they were very happy and then they came to class and they're like, oh, but I didn't like that I couldn't do this and this kind of bothered me. And then I was like, exactly, right? So, uh, you know, um, like we, we think these things are easy because they're quick, but they're also problematic. And so it was like, there was literally like the, the time in class where all the students were complaining and I'm just sitting back like tapping my fingers <laughs> with joy. Um, and so the next part of that project um, is to have them do hand-drawn or um, kind of digitally drawn renderings of what would their ideal chronology look like. Not specifically a timeline, but any way of drawing this time out. Um, so that leads into kind of what the big final projects are for the class. Uh, it really is to step back from worrying about algorithms, to step back from worrying about coding, and asking them to redesign outhistory.org 
from a conceptual prototype uh, perspective. So they're just starting now, they're, they're working in two groups, and they have to come back with a redesign of the site. Um, in some medium, there are interactive prototype tools, there are also Prezi where you can lay out, but just in a way that kind of storyboards a, a way that they would lay out a new front page, um, kind of a new uh, way into a story, into an essay. That, that takes into consideration all of these historical thoughts that we're having, the, the questions of aesthetics, the way the timelines are presented, the way you navigate. Right now, the front end of outhistory.org is very hard to manage. Um, just the layout you can see, um, you know, there's like lots of blocks of different shapes and like what you can you click on and what you can not click on is the stuff that's really important prioritized and um, it's somewhat of a navigational nightmare and we acknowledge it's a nightmare. It, it, the best thing is Jonathan agrees with this so we can be critical in the class without hurting his feelings. Um, so, uh, and so that's what their final project is, is together. They're also crafting and they also have to worry about more work. Um, they're also each writing two new essays that go along with their timelines that will hopefully make it into history.org. So they're thinking of them, we're thinking of them as historians who have to create content, but also as uh, designers and, and project uh, workers who are rethinking the frame that that content would go in. Um, so that's how we've evolved the class. And I love doing classes like this because the students are thrown into kind of historical reading, then to deep theoretical analysis, and to kind of uh, digital practical projects, and to creative projects, um, and to then invert and rethink all of that stuff from the perspective of all of that knowledge. Um, and I think they like it. Uh, we'll see by the end of the semester. Um, so I think I'm going to hand it over to Liz now, who has been, it's, Liz and I realized um, <laughs> after having a conversation that we had taken a class together at NY, at CUNY 15 years ago, um, and happened to run into each other again. So. Uh, we actually have a weird long history, and and she, she's been a great colleague, and she's going to talk a little bit about like what queering the web means and why that term and has become kind of the the title for the class. Thanks. Um, okay, so when Kiman asked me to be part of this class and described it, I was very excited. Um, I'm not a historian, but I work in uh, my uh, fields are queer theory um, and public discourse. Hence, I'm in the media department here at NYU. Um, <clears throat> so the way these two things interact, queer, uh, queer theory and public discourse, not just queer theory, but queer lives maybe, and, and, and public discourse is, is really interesting to me. I mean, my broader, broader concern is with public discourse as an essential part of democracy. And um, we live in, uh, with a, a degraded public discourse, I would say, right now. Um, it's becoming more and more degraded, <laughs> it seems. Um, um, so my, I'm, I'm interested in, in um, you know, what to me is an ideal, uh, pro impossible to achieve ideal of public discourse that, that is uh, thinking of public discourse as a place where, where the public, there's no such thing as the public, right, but people, citizens uh, participate in, in talk with each public talk with each other about matters of collective concern and reach some kind of um, rough and working consensus, which is actually what happens, but it doesn't happen in a very uh, you know and I it's as I say it's a degraded conversation. Um, so so that's um, I'm, I was excited about this this um, class because um, it seemed like an, an opportunity to explore that in terms of. Uh, digital media and the internet um, and, and how to bring uh, queer theory into that. Um, and I, um, as we started to work, we, we thought, oh, what does it mean to queer the web, right? We have, to, we have to define our terms. And we decided that, along with many other people, that queer refers to a group of uh, uh, kinds of people uh, whose um, Self-identity is marginalized because of their sexuality or their gender. Um, so hence, we uh, queer is aligned with LGBTQIA, et cetera, et cetera. We keep adding more initials. Because one thing about queer is that it tries to stay open. It's a sort of anti-definition definition, right? Um, and, and so you could keep adding you know, our initials to LGBTQIA, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, that's one definition. You know, certain kinds of marginalized people, people who are marginalized because of uh, gender and sexuality and or sexuality. Um, it's a huge, it can be a huge, as, as Cedric says, baggy category, right? Um, 
The other definition of queer, too queer, um, I understand it as a destabilizing or disturbing of given categories of gender and sexuality um, or gender inflected ways of seeing and knowing in order to see things differently, to see things anew, to uh, move toward the future uh, that we want or we might desire, uh, a different um, way of thinking and seeing that's uh, in some ways always political because it's uh, oriented toward the future in some ways. Um, so um, we have these two different definitions and we're talking about queering the web. So what does that mean? Queering the web on one level just means bringing uh, various kinds of queer content into the web, which is what out history is all about, right? And it does it. Maybe not as, you know, elegantly <laughs> as we would wish, but it does it. Um, and, and, and there's many, many ways that there's already queer content on the web, right? In fact, there's queer content in other mass media forms. Um, but, but that's an ongoing process. Um, <clears throat> the other thing, the other side of this would, uh, is, is what um, Kimon was just talking about is uh, how might you queer the design of a website? Maybe, you know, queer the web is a huge broad project, right? <laughs> like a, but specifically we're thinking about how could we redesign this particular website um, how, in a way that's queer. Um, so, so this is problematic for me in two ways, at least two ways. One is what we're looking for is an efficiency of use in the, in the website, right? Uh, making it easy to use, uh, making it legible, easily legible. Uh, and um, this seems to push to me a little against what it might mean to queer the web in which you're trying to disturb given ways of thinking right, uh, 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 given epistemologies um, or uh, ways of seeing. So um, if we talk about, and we did, we talked about the grid and its history within uh, modernity and modernism and uh, ways of thinking, sort of rationalist ways of thinking. Um, it's what we are accustomed to as uh, when we're looking at visual um, representations uh, we, we think of it as the best way to present material rationally, uh, clearly, logically, right? So we can easily access it. Um, uh, this is what we want <laughs> in our website. On the other hand, we're trying to mess with that paradigm, right? We're trying to mess with that way of thinking and seeing. Um, it, uh, so there's a problem there between, you know, clarity and sort of m trying to mess things up. And not just for the sake of, you know, being troublesome, right? But troubling the way we have of seeing the world and especially around gender and sexuality because queer is about gender and sexuality, desire. Um, how do we mess with that in a way that's productive, right? That allows us to see things we didn't see before, right? I, you know, and I really don't know what the answer is <laughs> to this. I'm like, no, maybe. We, we, every week, it's, it's almost purposely the like, impossible question to ask every week. Right. Um, so it's the pain, yeah. but good. When we got into, <laughs> yeah, when we got into the timeline and, and somebody, one of the students said, well, does querying the web just mean not using a straight line? <laughs> <laughs> and then we like started playing around, well, we could use a wavy line or we could use a spiral line. So then I got into a big conversation about this. Uh, would that be querying the web, right? That seems a little simplistic. Um, but, you know, it's interesting to think about that. And I, I talked about a, a, a timeline that I saw that I loved, and I don't know how it was made. I just, somebody posted it, and I, I wish I had saved it. But it was like a wavy moving line, right? And you could, like, click on certain parts on this line, uh, and a little pocket would open up and there would be text and images within that pocket. I thought, you know, wow, that is so cool as a timeline. It's not a straight line, right? It's something, and it's mobile. It's like it was literally moving, right? Um, so we, we talked about that some. Um, we looked at um, Tufti's um, visual confections, right? Um, 
Kimon brought it, had us read one of Tufti's texts, and it has this wonderful chapter on visual confections as an assembly um, of many visual events on one page. You know, and he, he uses um, the famous title page of Hobbes's um, Leviathan as an example of a confection, right? Uh, there's text, there's images, there's images within images, there's um, a certain organization to it. Uh, but it's a really rich, um, single page with lots of information in it and um, that you have to sort of navigate and think through and explore, right? Um, and, you know, this is, this is a model for, of design, I think, um, that's interesting, but it's actually in many ways very close to what uh, is available, uh, like in a web page, in some ways. A web page has depth, it has complexity, it has lots of information, you have to navigate it. Uh, I mean, it goes way beyond a, a visual confection in, in that sense. Um, so it's already got this kind of uh, rich, deep complexity, uh, a, a format or a frame for that kind of uh, design going on. Um, and it's happening, it's already there. Um, it does happen in the screen that's a, a rectangle and you know, we have like, oh, we don't have this out history up, but you know, we have all the like little blocks of um, visual text. It's all very rectilinear, usually, unless you're, you know, there's of course Prezi, which is another whole like way of moving. Um, but none of these options necessarily queer in the sense of destabilizing what we know in order to see and understand things differently. Um, so I thought, um, Uh, you know, here's the problem, here are the problematics of it, you know, this thing of communicating clearly and efficiently at the same, well, at the same time messing things up. Um, and um, along with this uh, goes, um, Jonathan was just talking about the ease or use of uh, function. Is that really the same as the easeful thinking or easy thinking, right? Of uh, following the same lines of thinking that we're used to? I think you could, might make an interesting <laughs> distinction there. Um, Anyway, I, I, you know, I finally, I came to the thought, like maybe in order to think about queering design, we would have to, th especially for a queer history s website, was think, what do we want history to do, right? What do we want LGBTQ history to do? Do we want it to celebrate queer lives? Do we want to, uh, to help us legitimize and enfranchise queer kinds of people? Um, do we just want to, <coughs> document and um, put out there in the world all the wonderful, rich diversity of, of queer lives, which is, I think, out history really does well already. Um, but anyway, and then there are other things that history, uh, queer history could do. So the question is, what do you want it to do? And then you think about a design that works for that, right? Do you want queer history to disrupt ordinary ways of thinking about history, right? ordinary ways of thinking about the history of sexuality, the history of gender, right? Um, how, what kind of design would work for that? And I don't have an answer, but I think that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, every time we started, especially like the, the queering the web, it, it became this kind of conflict between the, most of the examples of other people like using queering techniques were to create digital practices that were unworkable, right? <laughs> and, and so then, then you start getting the, there, there's so many kind of like ontological ruptures going on that like you really have to deal with. So one of the arguments about certain structures of design is that we biologically respond to things visually in certain ways, right? So I even, I was thinking about like where I play into this mode when I create a course website. It's like, you know, like, well, header one is the biggest and header two goes down a certain percentage of font. Like, and those are really regularized and normative in a way that is like something you would want to queer but like part of it is like well i want my eye to see the big thing first and like um and then when you start talking about questions of biology in a classroom where you're talking about queerness and and the trouble. debate all around that like you know is a biological like and like the structures of identity and like is judith butler wrong or is she right you know um and so it's been this it's been this fabulous kind of like really frenetic dialectical thing going on in class um, where we never come to any conclusions because like we want to be careful not to come to overbearing conclusions at the same time and um, uh, so so that but that practice is 
I've felt it very rewarding. Uh, you know, I feel like every time we go through that, we we feel like we're acknowledging a lot, and there's this kind of accumulation of um, awareness um, that it, we think is lacking. But so, like, it's functionality. Like, what is the border between something being functional uh, to it being hegemonic? Right? Like, the, the, is there a threshold um, that you have to be wary of, or are we overthinking it, or like, are, are we underthinking it by saying we're overthinking it? And so that's a kind of a wonderfully fraught place to be in that part of my concern whenever I'm involved in digital and, and information based things is that it, it's like it's flashy it's visual it's great it's new let's see it and it'll move forward and like this has been a little bit of putting the brakes on all of that um, and even stepping back 20 years um, and then kind of deliberately going through all of the possibilities um, that could have happened at different points um, and analyzing them carefully um, and and not to be too preachy about it all. Like uh, it hasn't been a preachy class, which has been good. And this like we haven't had students in that. And I think the three of us try to balance each other. Um, uh, and it's building that pedagogy is a fun process. And so so Cindy, what do you think about the pedagogy? Like so Cindy is <laughs> one of the student who was willing to stand up for the whole class and be here. Um, and so we want her to share her experiences. Uh, and no punishment on your grade, no matter what you say. So. <laughs> 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 well, I guess I, I'll just start with why I wanted to take this class. Um, I actually thought it would be a class more about querying the web from the bottom up. I thought it would be more about intersectional, inter, intersectionality because I thought it was going to be querying the web within the framework of what we already have. So perhaps social media where, a lot, where we communicate now most of the days instead of face to face because maybe it's just harder and it'll be easier to just go online and send off a tweet to someone or perhaps like make a status on Facebook. I thought it would be more about how we can queer the web from that point from perhaps having more queer people on the web and having more content generated by them. So on the first day of class, I was actually surprised that we we're going to have <laughs> a more top-down view about how we're going to like actually generate our own content, including the like web design itself. So that was like a wake-up call immediately. But the other thing that I was really can we go back to the uh, course, syllabus yeah. mm -hmm. and I actually really enjoyed was I was not expecting like the social construction of time or like timelines <laughs> at all in something called clearing the web. And um, I think one of the most interesting and rewarding uh, classes was actually when we all presented on the timeline JS. If mm -hmm. we, can we go actually to- Do you want to see your timeline? Yeah, no, Middle Berry the Gaze. I think that was a really good one that everyone just like woke up to. Which one? Berry the Gaze. Gaze. Berry your Gaze. Which one is that? It was, um, um, is it the mantis? Yeah. Yeah, I don't Zeno? No. No. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, the, the, the murders. Yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> the TV murders. <laughs> that doesn't sound as bad as it sounds. Uh, uh, no, it's Joe Allen. No. It, it's Jolie, okay. yeah. So this is the website, the course website, and yeah, yeah, this one. And this is a timeline that one of my classmates made called Barrier Gaze. She took the trope of how a lot of times when in media, when queer people show up, they almost die immediately after, no matter what. And then so she made a timeline pretty much categorizing, categorizing um, the ones that she could find in movies and TV shows, and she just made a timeline showing like, oh, in this episode, this person showed up for two minutes, said they were queer, and then immediately got killed somehow. <laughs> and then so like this time, like these timelines, now this one is made from Timeline JS, and it's more of like a straight one in a way, because it literally just goes chronologically, but in the class. Did you say it was a straight one? Me. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then in the classes, in the class, I think it was, was only like one day that we just went on about all the like differences and like, I think, so one day in class we just went into how timelines can be queered, how histories are queered, 
and then they would do that week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they would do that. Yeah. Okay, so it was just one class. Yeah. Okay. And then I think that was a really rewarding part because I, I actually did open my eyes to how queerness is not, you know, like we can also go from the top down. Because I always thought of queerness as we have to rise against, we have to come out of the closet. We are like always in a framework that is always catered to the heterosexual, to the, um, to like what oppresses us. And then we always have to fight against it. But this one is like more of a, we can create our own not only like digital like websites on the internet but we can also like do it in our only all in our daily lives we can like see things in a way that always have a queer angle to it and so that was what i most like enjoyed in the class so far good, and good. i might enjoy something else later <laughs> <laughs> why don't you talk about your two research projects um so again become one of my research projects is on um because I thought it was from the bottom up. I, I'm actually doing my thesis on um, representations of hip hop and masculinity. And then so one of my research projects is on film and cinema and how black queer people are like always pushed aside. When we think of queer political activism these days, we usually think of the white male cisgendered middle class gay. We don't really think of like people of color, women of color, trans people. And it even shows in the like Stonewall movie that received a lot of criticism of how it erased a lot of trans <coughs> women of color in the riots, which another classmate of mine is actually making a different timeline about every hour of the riots. And it's really interesting. I'm like looking forward to her work. So one of mine is how from the 1980s to the present, how a lot of representations of queer blackness is either erased or like always centered around the white, around whiteness mostly. Whenever there's an interracial couple, it's always like there's a white person in it and then a person of color. There's a white person in it and then there's a person of color. So my, I've been trying to specifically look for a black and a person of color couple and it was actually quite hard and uh, I actually had to go to several different sources had to go to the Bob's librarian she helped me she actually cited out history as a website that I should use <laughs> <laughs> and then I just couldn't find anything so I had to expand my research and then I'm trying to um, find a way to incorporate both like visually um, what I want to have like perhaps YouTube videos, uh, Bible videos, also into my out history um, essay. But also, there's always the consideration of what exactly is a um, format that is queer, that can fit out history, but also, again, that can um, be readable and accessible to people. Um, and the second one is about sex work, about homeless queer youth in New York City specifically, and how um, not only how they have to go into survival sex, but also now how they have they use like social media to find ways to survive on the streets. How survival sex is not only a way for them to find shelter, food, money, but also a way for them to perhaps get a support network, also find agency within their lives instead of having just the loss of like feeling depressed, down, but also having like control over their lives as well. So I feel like. This class is not only very fascinating because of all the debates we get to and almost never actually come to a conclusion with, <laughs> but, uh, but also just all, all the things that we learn, the interests that different um, classmates have, and also just all the different ideas that we all bring up. Because there, not only does queer encompass people of like different uh, sexuality, sexualities and genders, there was also a point made up of how accessible we can give it to people how like perhaps people with disabilities when they use a web how can they see like before when you said that you could like barely see with the different things how we can have higher contrast contrast resolution how we can make font bigger perhaps we can make it download downloadable to people so they can read it on their e-readers instead if they have amazon products or like ibooks different readers for people and then eventually like We'll find a way to not only make it accessible, but also have it with a queer slant, and also like have different people who are oppressed like actually speak out and be heard. Great, thank you, Cindy, very much.
Hey, Kadia. I'm over here. Do you want to just shout out a little bit and tell us uh, what you've, you've been finding? We wanted to like put the whole all the students on the panel, and and but there would have been like ten people. So, uh, but we do want other other students to get a choice to voice what they're getting out of the experience. Yeah. No, I just do want to, that's an interesting point. Like we, this is like has spatial limitations in pedagogy, like are based on kind of like perceived structural norms even like, like and so what was happening is, so, so Jonathan has a hearing aid. The students were all behind these kind of like black 2001 monolithic <laughs> boxes. Um, and we're, we're all spending all class going like this. <laughs> we're all frustrated kind of like subconsciously. So the conversation didn't open very, very well. The screens are quite large. Yeah, like little Jonathan was getting up and standing. They the students basically. Yeah. Like where are? We? Yeah, no, we, we like we got to a point where it was like if you want to talk, you have to stand up, which just felt really weird for a class with like nine people in it. And so, um, uh, so it like it, the whole class has been a project of kind of this like, like, active actively engaging with space and, and design and, and changing it. So that's a good point. So sorry, I cut you off. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the first one I've done, can you show the uh, yep. timelines? The first one I've been working on uh, that I really enjoy a lot is uh, the presence of transgender athletes. Starting from around 2003, when the International Olympic Committee first established guidelines for rec recommendations for the participation of trans athletes in competition. And then from there, I highlight some of the uh, more well known and Great, and that's an interesting thing about how like 
the formalism of history often forces you to tell a different type of story. Like, uh, it, like, like Katie was looking for data points when she wanted to tell a narrative story, and like, and there was a tension there, and so it was another good conversation. So, how about uh, the audience? Yeah, no, I was gonna say like I, I think we're good, uh, it, but we'd love to hear questions and and comments. Can we Jenny, turn the or? lights on now. Yeah, so yeah. I, it's, we can't see. Yeah. Yeah. You got one of these? Can I just grab one? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for this panel. It's been so fascinating. Um, I wonder uh, to, if you could talk about accessibility issues and whether or not um, in terms of accessibility for people with um, vision uh, issues. Because when you're talking about, you know, header one, um, the way we biologically internalize those things, those things become very relevant for people with um, uh, vision problems. And, um, and they're, they're required according to accessibility um, guidelines. So when we're talking about kind of exploding the frameworks of design and trying to disrupt that, how do we disrupt that without um, obfuscating the information that we have for those who, um, for whom accessibility is a real issue? If you want to go ahead, yeah. Um, one, of, one of the things that Out History uh, needs to do in, in its redesign is make it, uh, the redesign, uh, so that it's accessible on different, all different kind of phones and uh, uh, iPads and all those things that are people are using huge, very often now. That's how people access the, the web and probably in the future more and more. Um, so those things, look, for instance, on your phone you can enlarge. Um, you know, uh, a, a thing which you can't do on Out History now, but I I can see your it, I can see that there would be that ability if it was made for a phone, for instance. You, you would have that ability to make it larger when you needed to. I'm specifically asking about screen readers. Like yeah. Screen. Screen readers. So. Uh -huh. Visually. Oh, sorry. So people who are visually impaired um, use uh, plat technologies to read. Um, web content for them. Mm -hmm. um, so, so my question is, oh, uh, is more about oral one. Oral one. right? Yeah, they read right. it back. Yeah, right. yeah. Right. Yeah, go ahead, Cynthia. We actually had like a spe specific discussion on it too, because I also have a disability specifically for reading on the web. And then, so we were actually thinking about when we are querying, like even site designs, where like we can make text either larger and smaller. Or we could have like an audio reader for someone to like read and describe pictures for us. The problem is, um, I think you said we mentioned about how like then it'll be it'll be too cluttered, right? It'll be too cluttered to be like there's yeah. a lot of things also visually that people also have to like click on. Like, what should we prioritize first, second, third, again? And then so, and then the class evolved. <laughs> I mean, I'll, but, I'll, I'll be com I'll be completely honest. There should be another co course called accessing the web, right? Because like, like when I hear these things, it's like, okay, like we can't talk about that without really unpacking all of that. And I know I've avoided doing accessible stuff for a long time because it's such a, it's a, to be completely honest, it often becomes a design time quagmire that people are w unwilling to invest the time in, right? Because, um, but it's becoming more and more important. And I'm working with the Smithsonian on a project now. Um, which is supposed to be this huge like visual art historical thing and and I made sure that we put in the contract for the first time I've ever done this that it had to be fully accessible because uh, we just uh, this journal that I'm working on the Journal of Directive Technology of Pedagogy we just made our site accessible and we ran into all of these blips and the, and it made me realize how much we ignore that stuff uh, and the challenge here is like it's kind of cordoning off an accessible body of uh, of material for us and and it was since you brought that up I'm remembering you had that conversation now and and it was it is like because so many of the things we've we've read about queering have been like making it funky and broken so it doesn't work and like and like that's for that's for like people who don't have accessibility issues right yeah. like and so it like I I hope your group thinks about that when you do your design you know like it's on you now uh, um, uh, because you're you're like 
it often takes like the activism of someone who's per personally invested, like you with you and doing all this history back in the seventies, Jonathan, um, to get that stuff launched off. And um, but it's a whole another level. Like you could have this entire class about those issues, um, and and maybe it's something down the road that we do at Draper again if we find the right opportunity. Um, I, I think it would be nice, to, like you know, like to teach these classes a pair one year, you know, like to do that class and then to do this class again in a way. That's really a valuable. Thank you for yeah. bringing that up. Hi, thank you for a wonderful presentation and uh, panel. Um, I'm not gay, but I'm interested in this panel because of what it discusses. My uh, approach, I'm a visual artist primarily, and my approach is on the notion of uh, identity, self, and consciousness. How do people represent themselves to others, and how do they recognize who they are? Listening to you, specifically Elizabeth, in terms of querying the web, it seemed to me you are more interested in, actually, you, the word you use, disrupting and messing up the others. And yes, to have a self, you must see a contrast of the other. However, I would argue that it probably be more productive if you concentrate on presenting who you are, how you see yourself, as opposed to de deconstructing the others. Because in putting the energy of disrupting and messing the others, I'm not so sure it's revealing who you are. And I'm saying that also from a perspective of a minority who's not only black, but also Haitian. Like what most people are not aware of is that within the black community itself, there is some type of conflict. I'm Haitian, you're Jamaican, you know, I'm African American and all these things, you know, there's that going too. So, I'm not interested in disrupting the other. I'm interested in presenting myself. And the other will then see me, who I am. I, you know, I don't think, I, I don't see queering as a, um, disrupting the other. It's uh, y one way of thinking of it is disrupting normal, normalizing ways of seeing the other or seeing the self, right? So of course, how we present ourselves uh, is really important. And it's one of the things I write about, how we you know, craft and present a public self, you know, even as private people, you know? Um, so it's, it's not about disrupting, you know, how people present themselves, I don't think at all. Uh, it's about allowing more room for how people present themselves. And also being able to, uh, to read more, um, with more accuracy maybe, or with more awareness um, of the other, whatever that means, many others. We're all other to each other, right? Yes. <laughs> so so um, I think, Queering is a way of like opening up the way, our ways of seeing, so that we can actually see how it, one of the things it does is allow us to see the other person as they present themselves. Are you familiar with uh, Aperture Foundation? No. It's a, an organization, uh, Aperture Foundation is an organization in Chelsea, and they have a photographic uh, publication called Aperture. I believe it is for homo homosexuality also. And I say that because when you see the magazines, there is no question about it. Mm -hmm. You can tell. It is that form of publication, mm -hmm. and they have no hesitation of putting it out there the way they want it. So they're not, in my view, they are not trying to contract, they are just trying to present who they are. Mm -hmm. A word you just mentioned is the word normal. What, yep. what, what is normal? It's who is defining what is normal. 
and heteronormative is the word heteronormative. And I, I think in terms of design, my observation is very much dominated by the gay community. Like what? By homosexuality. The, 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 by, by the gay community in terms of design. And why I say that because a lot of our design approach comes from the fashion industry that we may not be aware of. And very subtle, and it's coming in there, and we don't see it, but it's playing a major role. So I would not say that uh, it's hetero heteronormative. Um, just, um, I think that my work on uh, heterosexual history is a way of questioning something, questioning heterosexuality in a way it hasn't been questioned before, and looking at the social construction of heterosexuality and homosexuality. The, the rise of those two words, those two concepts, those two ways of organizing human relationships, um, I think that is um, a very concrete example, a, uh, a good example of, of, the, int of the desire of uh, me and people working on the website to question the normal, what's normal, and in a very specific way, in a very, look, well, what's the evidence of the different definitions of normal? When I looked, when I did research on heterosexuality, I discovered that it wasn't considered normal when it first came in, because it was focusing on sexuality, and uh, sexuality was still considered bad. It wasn't, fo the, the terms heterosexual wasn't focusing directly on procreation, like the old, which was the old standard of normal sex. So anyway, there's that very complicated uh, history. Um, it's interesting also that um, we chose, I chose the name out history rather than, it doesn't have any identity category directly associated with the name. Um, that was an attempt to uh, maybe play down identity as, as one of, as the major analytical uh, concept that we use in thinking about uh, sexuality in history. Um, we have focused on that because it's been so important. The identity movements have been so important. That's, I got to do work in LGBTQ history because there was a movement. I wouldn't be doing it if the, the Gay Activist Alliance hadn't organized in the early, uh, after Stonewall. Um, so the movement led directly to doing the history. Um, yeah, I guess that's what I want to say. About I, I just, I want to make a point about, uh, there's, uh, about really delineating how this conversation happens, right? Because it was important to be specific about that. The question is about talking about his, the, the historical construction of mediating technologies, right? Because I, I agree, like you don't, in the conversation of disrupting the other, presenting your, own, presenting your own identity, that sensibility is about your kind of personal existence. But once you start going into mediating technologies, whatever you project into that technology is filtered and and at the other end, you are in some ways losing full autonomy of that. Um, and then, because part of that is the technologies and the history that has gone into the development of that technology. And so then what are the implications of that historically? And we often tend to think of technological histories about, about being features and um, the mechanistic uh, structures that are behind them, but they are deeply imbued with the people that are involved in them. And so, uh, I mean, even thinking about like, like, you know, fashion in the art world where there's a lot of gay people, uh, you know, s saying that there have often been a lot of gay people and for a long time they weren't allowed to express that they were out. And often those, those 
models of art were oppressive in a certain way because certain norms were expected um, in order for them to be functional in the market, in order for them not to be thrown in the waste bin. So what is the historical precedent for all of that? And has it had a lasting effect on the way we perceive things? Um, and how do we often shelve those conversations for the kind of rapid thrust of the, the, the kind of futurism of the information age? And so this whole class was, it, it was less of making a political statement, and like I said before, but more of putting the brakes on and trying to pull back on the, the history of the practice of all of this and wonder where even if gay people were participating, they weren't realizing the heteronormative structure was filtering their identity, you know? Um, you know, it's like, if uh, if an African American person starts working at the um, in the South Carolina government, does it mean that this the waving of the Civil War flag in front of the state house isn't racist anymore? I mean, it's like so like how how do structures become nor normative by their historical generation, and how do they then in their power kind of become um, obfuscating and kind of consuming of alterity? Uh, and so that was really like is the web one of those spaces? Uh, and so that was interesting. You know, Cindy's like, well, like oh, is this about people going online and using Facebook and Twitter. It's like, well, what if Facebook and Twitter are even heteronormative? That was kind of like the step back we took, you know? Like, like in their structure and design, they're actually limiting and controlling the ability to represent yourself as not within the standard uh, accepted norms. And so th there's, there's an importantness of it being a mediating technology being constructed by human history. Um, Facebook used to just have like male and female as identifiers, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, that, so it, that simple thing, yes, it was absolutely yeah, even bathrooms, right? Like it, to get to something. Thank so why don't we move to the, another question? Yeah, uh, she she was in the back, I think, before. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, I think this is all really interesting. Um, uh, I'm interested in this issue that you're bringing up about the rigidity of these infrastructures, and then the fact that when like uh, many times attempts to hack these infrastructures become so inaccessible and frustrating and um, illegible and all that stuff. So I'm wondering two things. One is what you think about a more open, flexible platform like WordPress, say, as opposed to Omeka. And also, I kind of, I really like this um, wavy line example. <laughs> um, and I wonder if you have other examples of things that you think uh, are doing something interesting in this regard. No, I don't know about all my websites. So it's like I'm shy. <laughs> hmm. um, do I have to answer this? No, I mean I think WordPress is no much be not much better than Omeka. It's just a different platform, right? Like, like the it's that's kind of the conundrum we've come to. It's this like functionality, accessibility, both for accessibility use and uh, um, kind of like uh, people with accessibility issues and general accessibility, like. Like, where do we go? Uh, and that's really the, the challenge of the student's assignment, uh, like, is to unpack that and to be able to be creative in a way that has nothing to do with an actual working website at this point. Um, and, and to try to find those representations. Because, like, it's what happens when a, a website becomes an art object rather than a, a, a deliverer of information on a site that's historical, right? Like, that's also what we don't want to do, you know? Like, um, and, and I think, you know, like we, like I said, Liz and I both study performance theory and performance history. Like that's a place where there's been a lot of experimentation of like, like you know, queering performance and, and liveness and identity. But they're in the scope of art objects where like the the lack of transparency of the content is part of the project. And and there's this that's that's a challenge. So. I, I I have uh, gone to a couple of different design firms and asked them about presented my vision, ambitious vision for out history. And they have suggested that WordPress would be a better starting a software platform. Uh, both of them uh, suggested that, and they suggested it would cost like $100,000 to, to redesign, uh, to, to include the complicated um, visionary, vision ways of searching that I would envision it, it having. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's uh, my take on that. <laughs> I don't know, I have, it's hard for me to evaluate, you know, any of that. Turn it up here. Um, the microphone. And the microphone. Um, I also have a question about structure. When you start your presentation, you talked a little bit about 
the idea of you as an independent scholar and and uh, the, the structural barriers to information, and this is also a public history uh, process in creating this. I'm really interested in the question that I think is sort of built in into that is is our history as a, a nonprofit and is, will continue on um, as an organization, but the structures that whatever structure you create might, by definition, in the nature of the web. Uh, become dated and might disappear. And so one of the things I think about Mecca that people always advocate for is that it's built on this structure that has like these very strong institutional backers behind it. Like it uses Dublin Core. So librarians all over the all over who understand Dublin Core know how to use the information. So like it can be transferred and it has this sort of it has that benefit to it. So is there did you guys you had all these great conversations, which I wish I could have heard, but did you talk about what do you lose when you move towards this, uh, a more customized, more open platform? What, what happens in terms of like data preservation? What happens in terms of like uh, sustainability for the things that you're collecting? Because your wiki, like you said yourself, your wiki, well, you can't find it unless I tell you where it is, like the, the, the original wiki version of your site. So this seems to be like a classic question for a lot of organizations when they're making history sites, I've run into this myself, that the history might disappear when they make a decision on one platform and, and they, they struggle with like what decisions to make. So like what what did you talk about in terms of that? Like you're I understand completely the desire to queer the web, but also as a as a historian think about what's gonna happen fifty years from now, what's gonna happen a hundred you know, in, in, in terms of those institutional spaces and the platforms and so I'm curious did you guys talk about that question at all the the issue of uh, transferring uh, content from the original site to the new site was not discussed sufficiently <laughs> the problem and the amount of time that it would take so there's still important data uh, content on the original site that never got transferred it's terrible um, nobody advised, thought about it deeply enough because they weren't aware. A historian was in charge who didn't know much about the web. And the designer didn't warn that historian that there would take a lot of time transferring stuff. It had to be done manually. I hope that in the future, that par partly putting it on, if it was WordPress, it I been told that it would be easier to transfer from that to the, I don't know, I can't, I don't know what to believe since I'm not a technical person uh, in terms of all the. Uh, There's no existing strategy. I mean, I can just see it. And, uh, and it's going to be awful getting it out of Omeka. It's going to be miserable. Getting it out of Omeka. Getting it out of yeah. Omeka is going to be miserable. Yeah. So uh, it's and a it's going to take someone who knows what they're that doing. You raise that lucky you found me, Jonathan. To think about <laughs> what, what's that? I said you're lucky you found me. <laughs> I know. I'm lucky I, know. I found you. It's I know. lovely. It's great. Um, <laughs> I, I think both these questions point to basic fundamental problems with digital culture. One is yeah. it's sustainability, right? And that's got many facets to it, right? Changing in technology, equipment, software, et cetera, et cetera. The other it, it makes you just want to have a, a book library, you know, like <laughs> go to print. I can hold this book and keep it. Of course, that's, you know, you can't save everything forever. Um, but that's one basic fundamental fundamental problem with digital culture. The other is, this, I, to me, the question you raise is about, okay, so you have software for creating these various kinds of digital text, and they're really cool, but they're limited. Um, and in order to make them more, um, flexible, more th that the, the user can do more things and be more creative, like that wavy line timeline. I don't know what software they used. I want to know. I've got to find out now. But um, I can guarantee, I can 99% guarantee it's not easy, sort of an easy thing to, to use um, for the, you know, for average users. So, so that's another problem is how do you um, design digital s or software or websites or whatever that allow for maximum creativity on the user's part without making it so complicated. And, and you know, this, these are things that I use. Obviously, it's a brand new media. It, these things will work out in some way more or less effectively. But. 
So. Yeah, sorry. Sorry to cut this conversation yeah, short. No, lots of great uh, we questions. We hit 11.15, yeah, yeah. but um, there is time for people to chit chat with the presenters for the next 15 minutes before our next panel starts. So I want to thank Kimon and Elizabeth and Cindy and Jonathan for all of their great um, insights. And thanks so much for being our first panel. Thank you for having us. Thank you.